During July 1922, the British Parliament debated and finally approved what was known as the Churchill White Paper. And then the draft of the mandate for Palestine was confirmed by the Council of the League of Nations and was approved on July 24th. The preamble to the mandate document incorporated the wording of the Balfour Declaration. Another foundational clause in the preamble states, whereas recognition has thereby been given to the historical connection of the Jewish people with Palestine and to the grounds for reconstituting their national home in that country. The mandate is based upon the Balfour Declaration and that declaration has been in incorporated by reference at least in three places. It's been incorporated specifically in the San Remo resolutions which established that Britain was to take the mandate. Uh, it has been referred to in the Treaty of Sevra between the Allied powers and Turkey as to the disposition of the Ottoman territories. And it was specifically referred to and incorporated by reference into the Palestine Mandate. The information that I've received, the documents I've looked at, indicate that the preamble, which specified what rights the Jews would receive and the recognition of their historical connection and right to reconstitute what they used to have, was drafted by Lord Balfour. Fascinating. Not only was he connected, of course, to the Declaration in 1917, not only was he in Paris on February 27, 1919, when the Jews presented their claim, but he was the one who drafted the preamble, which makes it very clear the extent to which their demands have been accepted and recognized. In formulating legally binding instruments, there was a recognition of the cultural historic roots of the Jewish people in that land that it was more than just a legal decision, it was based in the cultural heritage of the Jewish people. They are recognizing a pre-existing right and not creating a new right. In other words, the historical rights of the Jewish people to this land were recognized by the great powers at the time, by the equivalent of the UN at the time. Which means that if they can establish that they had a vibrant community in, in Jerusalem or in Hebron or in Shiloh and in, in different areas of the Holy Land, they've been given the right to reconstitute these communities. The key to Article 2 is the decree, the enactment of the policy of the Balfour Declaration. It becomes part of international law. Article 2 of the mandate states, the mandatory, that is Great Britain, shall be responsible for placing the country under such political, administrative and economic conditions as will secure the Jewish national home. The mandate of Palestine was quite specific about who was the beneficiary of this right of self-determination. Uh, the preamble to the mandate tells us that the mandate was created in order to uh, reconstitute the Jew Jewish homeland on its ancient land. Uh, if you read through the mandate, you'll see there are a number of provisions that were designed to guarantee that. Uh, the, the mandatory authorities, the British, were supposed to cooperate with the Jewish agency in running the mandate. They were supposed to uh, encourage and facilitate the acquisition of citizenship by Jews, immigration by Jews, close settlement by, uh, 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 of Jews on the land. So there are all these provisions that show us that it was a mandate designed to guarantee the self-determination of uh, the Jewish people. The whole idea of the mandate was for the Jews to be given the right to immigrate so that the population could increase, so that while the trust is ongoing, they would be stronger, more numerous, and then could declare the independence of their country. That was a whole strategy. It's worth noting here that the mandate does not name any other ethnic group or any other peoples than the Jewish people as far as um, obtaining through the mandate political authority over this territory. 
it does mention the non-Jewish communities and does preserve for them, by the language of the mandate, their civil and religious rights. But all the political rights were reserved to the Jewish people. Now, later in the administration of the mandate, Britain decided that that proviso was to be weighed equally with the main objective, which was to establish a Jewish homeland in Palestine. Now, when I look at the words without prejudice, they are clearly subordinate to the main clause. If they were to be equal, then it would have said the purpose of the mandate is the establishment of the mandate for the homeland of Jews and the advancement of the Jews and the Arabs. They didn't say that. The mandate does not even mention Arab. It mentions non-Jewish communities. Consequently, I, I, I interpret this very much in the same, uh, as the same way as the Ottomans looked at the millet system for the non-Islamic communities to whom they gave a, a certain degree of self-government and security for their religious interests. Similarly, the Jews, if and when they were to become the majority population, are obliged to recognize the civil and religious rights of, again, non-Jewish communities, such as Islam, such as Baha'i, uh, Christian, and others. I want to underline that the primary objective of the mandate for Palestine was to grant political rights in respect to Palestine to the Jewish people. It was applied in favor of the Arabs in the area of Mesopotamia, in the area known as Syria and Lebanon. But in Palestine, the political rights of self-determination was exercised in favor of the Jewish people. As we turn to Jerusalem, it's important to understand the centrality of Jerusalem in Jewish history and Judaism in order to understand how one can reconstitute what these Jewish people used to have. So by 1922, there were three mandates for the purpose of forming four Arab nations, all of which had gained their independence by 1946. And so the agreement that Heim Weizmann made with Amir Faisal back in 1919 was entirely fulfilled. However, the agreement was quickly abandoned by the Arabs. As more original Zionist Jews were moving to Palestine and they're buying land and um, then starting to work on agriculture and they're tilling the fields and turning swamp and so on into arable land. There are people from the surrounding region who start going in to get jobs as laborers in the fields because the Jews are doing what the Arabs were never able to do, which is really run a very successful agricultural society. And in the meantime, you have, of course, those who are already resisting the Jewish presence. So they start in Hebron in 1929, carrying out small massacres and so on. So there is that unhappiness, it is developing. But Move to 1930, the time of the Passfield White Paper. Restrictions start to be imposed after so many years of conflict between Jews and Arabs in Palestine. Britain starts to turn her back on the Jewish people, starts to diminish the rights that were already given in the mandate for Palestine, contrary to their obligations as mandatory. 